Hello everybody, my name is Manzil Rana. Thank you Simon for getting me to Paris to talk to all of you today. Yeah? We talk about development in many fields. Automobiles, computers, you know, value chain, we can keep adding. We talk about innovation, innovative mobile phones, innovative you know, projectors, innovative cameras, but we don't talk about innovation in the field of development so much. Paris, London, you can develop as much you want, you can be as innovative as you can, but without bringing some innovation in the way you help the countries far away from you, you're still going to suffer from similar problems for a long time. The field of development, it's been very traditional, the approach you know, to development. There's an old saying, teach a man how to fish. I think it's a really flawed concept, it's a very old concept of teaching people how to fish and then they can fish for themselves. It sounds very good and nice. Let's say you want to help somebody in Nepal. You don't have time to go there and teach everybody how to fish. What are you going to get in return? You're not going to get anything. You don't have all day to just go helping people all day, you know. So who got the time to help people? The big multinational companies, the big non-profit organizations, the United Nations, Save the Children, Room to Read, Read to Room, blah, blah, blah. There are many organizations. The CEOs earn millions of dollars. They fly first class, luxury hotels, luxury accommodations, you know, their websites. Very nice, beautiful children, smiling. You, know. you look at the website, it's like, oh, we're developing Nepal, now we're going into Bhutan. Let's save, let's save Malala, you know. If, if they have been doing development for so long, for decades and decades, why are we still underdeveloped? Why are we still the poor immigrant coming to steal jobs? I think it's a really failed way to develop the world and I have a different approach. I have a model called the Maya model. We run the only free, private, non-governmental schools in Nepal. It's been three years and we run three schools and I want to show you how we do this. So I, I, I was studying in the United World College. We had students from all over the world and when I was in high school, we all thought like we're going to share ideas and one day we're going to take over the world. We're going to come up with great ideas that's going to change the world. I think you probably went through similar phases when you were younger. Yeah, and, uh, we were very idealistic. We did not like the way things were going and we thought of different ways to change this around. Then I went to the United States of America and I realized the world's really big and I can't just go around changing it. I thought I was having a little beer, smoking a thing here and there, making friends, changing myself is a better thing than get changing the whole world. I got a chance to travel in other parts of the world, came around to different parts in Europe, you know, with my friends and the more I traveled, the more I saw, I saw how the problems that you are facing here is directly related to the problems we are facing back home. We talk about being local all the time, yeah, like how we should produce our own food in Paris itself. But we buy computers from far away other countries, we buy your automobiles. So when we think of local, we should think of the earth as one small community. You know, if all the developed countries say, let's do things locally, locally, then it's going to bring bigger problems to the world. So when I was traveling around the world and, you know, drinking beer, in Nepal there was a revolution going on. Children in schools, all the, the people were saying, how come we don't have food on the table, we don't have electricity, we don't have healthcare, we don't have education, let's revolt. So they went to different schools, they started speaking and obviously the students got motivated. And then they picked up arms. There was a civil war which killed thousands of people, millions got displaced and homeless. And the king was finally out of the country. This happened in about 2006. So I thought, like, this is the most important time Nepal is going through till my, uh, to, in my life, you know. So I have to go back and I have to go become a part of this change. Like, this is where, this is, this is it. This is my destiny. So I went back, I left everything. And I went back to Nepal and I wanted to become a teacher in the public school there. So this is the condition of the public school. Two thirds of the children attend public schools in Nepal. 85% of them drop off and the remaining 72% of them fail. Many of you may be Buddhists here, I think it's a really cool reason these days, you know, and we believe in maybe poor people can be happy and rich people are sadder. But when you don't get to see your family for years and years because you're working in Qatar or Kuwait or America to earn some money to feed your family, you, your family is not being happy. You could be poor and you are also unhappy. So 
So this, this, this problem really bothered us. And all the multinational companies, the organizations, the money you give your money to, they help at work with the public education system, which is very corrupt, because they have, again, a very traditional approach. There's no system of, uh, you know, like penalties or rewards for the teachers who teach. So once you become a public school teacher, you can't be out of your job, so you can do whatever you want. And the system itself is very flawed. So we started our own school with a tent. It was a green color tent pitched in the jungle. Me and a couple of buddies of mine, we thought, okay, so there is a need for a school. The people don't trust the public education system. We can do something different. So we thought, let's just put a tent and let's get like a few children and let's see what we can do from there. We're going to start somewhere. But over 200 families wanted to study in this tent. There was a big school in front of us. It was built by the Norwegians and the Japanese, run by the government. It was very big on top of the hill, like a good view, you know, mountains everywhere. But kids did not want to go to school there because people know. You may not know that the UN and, you know, Save the Children are not doing a good job. But the people in rural Nepal, they know. So they wanted to study with me in this little tent school. The tent school became a bamboo classroom, you know, after, uh, after a while. So now here's the catch. I wanted to help people who don't have money to send their children to go to school. And I did not want to make it a charity because I really disbelieved it. I wanted to do something in the lines of social entrepreneurship. So I wanted to open a free school, but that's a for-profit school. My family and my friends all questioned me, so how is it going to work? How are you going to open schools where, you know, Kids don't have to pay. And I had heard by that time many other organizations around the world where there's like sharing. You know, like I help you, uh, I give you some classes on photography, you give me some classes on economics. But we're talking about small children here, like seven year olds, eight year olds. They're not going to give you, they're not going to be able to teach you anything. So we try to change our model a little bit. So instead of paying money, the parents of the students who go to my school, they work for my school for two days of every month. Okay? And I use this time, the two days, for example, to make bracelets. That's my co-founder, Central Yoon from Korea, yeah? We make these bracelets and we send to Korea. We also do other things. We, you know, we grow rice, we raise traditional chickens, we sell piglets, we have a goat farm, we're planting ginger, we're doing all kinds of organic farming right now to help generate some income to keep sustaining the school. Every morning we start the school with a big circle, close our eyes and we hug each other, it's like a hippie school. Yeah, but at people, there are volunteers from many parts of the world who come there. So if you want to volunteer, you're most welcome to come. Free food, free accommodation. And we take education very seriously. You know, there's taking the kids paragliding, riding on elephants, teaching them about many different things. Because we want our kids to grow up, you know, and one day to come to Paris and speak to you like this. Instead of always being on the receiving end and saying Namaste and thank you and thank you and Buddha and Shiva and Mount Everest. <laughs> we are doing more networking now. We have opened three more schools. So this is another school. It takes two days to get there. Uh, you can see nice views of the mountains from there too. And this is my, this is Ashish, Ashish Thai. Starting the same way, a little Maya circle, a little bamboo hut. And we know it's going to transform as more and more students come in, more and more well parents are going to volunteer. And we're going to make it a more permanent structures. We're going to build playgrounds, build computer labs. So the movement is going on. To end it with, right now we are looking for other kinds of partnership. Making a school is just a start. To provide quality education, to get all the resources going takes a while. So let's say you have a company and because uh, you outsourced your manufacturing to a country like Bangladesh a year ago in Rana Plaza, uh, more than 100 people died and a lot of, you know, it was because it's very hard labor conditions, making cheap Chinese products or Nepalese products. Uh, the product itself is cheap, but the labor condition is very difficult. So let's say you have a shoe company and you want to create a better name for yourself. So you spend a lot of money on marketing or company CSR. Instead of that, you can ask me to build some shoelaces for you. So I can use my manpower, my resources to build some shoelaces, free of cost. So if anybody asks you how much are you paying the laborers, you can say it's free of cost, they're giving us gifts. And then they say, why, 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 why your company is so nice? Why are they giving you free, free shoelaces? Then you can say, well, we go and build them classrooms. So that can change the way we are doing, you can be doing businesses. So if you are looking to outsource your manufacturing, 
our school is ready to help you out because our resource is the parents volunteering at the school and we need to make the most out of this resource. So if there's anything you can offer to that, we're most likely to come in there. Our model of Maya can be replicated, can be adapted to other developing countries around the world. People from developing countries, we do not need to depend upon big multinational non-profits, non-profits. We can do these things ourselves with a little effort from everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.